Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jane Hewitt and I'm the Capability Building Coordinator at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand are part of the Info Exchange Group, a not-for-profit social enterprise that tackles the biggest social challenges through the smart and creative use of technology. And for those of you who haven't attended a webinar session with us before, you can check out our calendar of events coming up online on Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. So welcome today to the webinar Preventing Account Takeover by Cyber, Cyber Criminals with IT Connection. And before we begin today, we'll just start with a bit of housekeeping. All lines are muted, so if you have any technical issues, please type them into the questions box on your GoToWebinar panel and I should be able to help. Likewise, if you have any questions during today's session, please just type them into the questions box and we'll have a Q&A session coming up at the end of today's webinar. Please note that your comments and questions won't appear to the rest of the group. If you're on a Wi-Fi connection and have multiple programs open, this can sometimes affect the quality of the video and the sound, so please just close any programs that you're not using. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a copy of the slides and the recording towards the end of today. And before we start, I'd just like to remind everybody that we send out a very short survey at the end of today's webinar, and we'd really appreciate any feedback. So that is all for me. I will pass over to Oscar today to get things started. Thank you, Jane. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Oscar from IT Connection. I'll be presenting a little bit about um, the dangers of account takeover. And for that, we'll... You're muted, Oscar. Sorry. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah. I guess I get a bit of start again from the beginning. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for attending. My name is Oscar from IT Connection, and I'll be presenting about how to prevent account takeover in general. And before we start, I'd like to do a little bit of a poll just to understand if any of the attendees here has received any phishing email in the last three months. Okay. I think the poll is running now with the help of Jane. And the results uh, are 67% yes and 33% okay. maybe. Yep. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So uh, we have another poll here. So you've received an email supposedly asking to confirm a webinar invite and the link takes you to this page as you can see on the screen. Um, would you accept the invite? I'll give it a one minute or so so everyone can see the picture and then we'll get Jane's help to run the poll. Would you accept the invite? Yes, maybe, no. This will be interesting. <laughs> so we've got maybe 25% and no 75%. That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. That's good to know. All right. So this talk is about uh, how to prevent account takeover in general through uh, various methods. And I'd like to give a brief overview in how these days, cyber criminal organizations are shifting their infrastructure to a more modern business-like model called ransomware as a service. So these days, business models focus on concentrating workforce with specialized skills and knowledge to increase productivity and efficiency. What I mean by that is, for example, with IT managed service providers, usually we provide uh, we purchase license for their for our remote management tools like TeamViewer, LogMeIn, etc. We don't build software in-house, so we can focus more on what we do best, which is managing our client's IT infrastructure instead of coding software, which is not our main business core. Accounting firms pay license to third-party software like MYOB, and these firms, again, focus on what they do best, 
which is managing their clients' financial accounts instead of for programming software. Same concept with these cyber criminals. They would focus on exploit and malware development as it requires deep, intimate knowledge on how operating systems work, and then they would partner up with affiliates or sell their exploits to threat actors on the dark web marketplace. This is because most cyber criminals don't possess these kind of skills, the deep knowledge skills. So developer groups would prepare the exploits in advance, ready for use, lowering the skill entry barrier and increasing the number of threat actors that are able to enter the market. These affiliates or partners then be the ones that are performing the initial reconnaissance, launching the attack and other works such as maintaining persistence in victims compromise service and providing quote unquote support to victims for a data decryption and payment. If the victim do pay and then the ransom payout it could be split between them or according to some partnership agreement like 25% commission if the ransom payout is under 500,000. One example here of these uh, groups called Darkside, notoriously known for colonial pipeline attack in the United States, that stopped 45% of the oil supply to the US East Coast region over six days, causing petrol price hike. If in the recent years uh, in Australia, we see um, petrol price actually kind of dropping down because of COVID, everyone's working from home, no one's going anywhere, so petrol's kind of gone down. It's the opposite there in the United States. During this attack, it's actually causing petrol price hike, panic buying in the eastern seaboard. So it got so big that US government actually got involved and the Black Hat Group ceased operation approximately one week afterward, after the attack. So it's huge news back there. Basically, they announced on their network that they've lost access to their command and control platform and had all of their crypto funds diverted by an unknown entity. Basically, they got hacked back by the government. So what they do, they just gave up, released all the decryptors for the companies that haven't paid them and called it quits. So cybercrime is a growing business globally, Australia included. You can see in the US market, ransom demands are increasing year after year as the median is pulled up higher due to huge ransom demands and victims actually paying these black hat groups. For example, the Colonial Pipeline paid Darkside four and a half million US dollars for the ransom, which is huge. Why do these victims pay? Even though government highly advised organizations not to pay ransom demands, basically don't, don't follow them, don't, don't do what they say. Well, simply say it's because ransom is usually much cheaper than the possible revenue loss. But diving a little bit deeper, this is because they don't just shut down your web servers and emails potentially halting your personal productivity for however many days or weeks and cause havoc to your sister organizations because they can also spread fraudulent emails to everyone that you work with. They don't just encrypt your data, stopping you from processing your important files like your research data, patient medical history, or bills that need to be paid to your suppliers or your contractors. Imagine if the attack happened at the, at the end of the month, stopping you from processing your staff monthly wages, which could spell HR disaster, right? But they'll also steal your sensitive data and threaten to publicly disclose the data leak, which would effectively ruin your organization's, organization's reputation and possibly, possibly preventing the organization from applying for future funding or grants, if you, especially if you don't pay the ransomware. Uh, one a blockchain analytic firm, Elliptic, identified over 90 million US dollars transferred to Darkside and their affiliate crypto wallet over the past year. Again, the ransom payout from Colonial Pipeline loan was four and a half million US dollars. So that's 90 million US dollars within one year, which is insane amount. So cybercrime is undoubtedly a huge business. And most of the initial compromise are from remote desktop attacks, especially if you don't use VPN to connect back to your servers, email phishing, zero day exploits and password spraying. Just a quick clarification, zero day exploit means a security bug or flaw in which the vendor or supplier has no knowledge of. So there is no patch available yet, which means end users, you or your IT, can't update your system and be protected. 
or simply because of a design flaw, it cannot be patched. So you might ask, where do these zero-day exploits come from? Well, some security researchers dedicate their life to software code review or called bug hunting. With no affiliation to software vendor and their goal is the financial reward, it's their livelihood to sell findings to third-party companies that specifically deal with this kind of product. The commodity is zero-day exploit. I mean, you can report your findings to vendor directly. If I find security bug with uh, Google Chrome, I can report it directly to Google and hope to be uh, financially rewarded. But some people have actually been sued instead of been rewarded. So that's a, that's a call you gotta make yourself. One third party company that specifically deal with zero day exploit is called Zerodium. Now you might think that the ethics and economics of this product might be kind of in the gray area. So it's another topic entirely. But the main point is that companies like this and Trend Micro ZDI pay huge amount for zero days, providing strong incentives for security people to dive deep and find gaps in, in software products. Where do these exploit land after being purchased? Who does Rhodium sell these exploits to? In their FAQ, they say it's mainly government organizations, mainly coming from Europe and US, but you never know. So you can see here the price back brackets for zero day exploits are staggering amounts up to two and a half million US dollars. Um, for iOS, an example here, the exploit could fetch two million dollars, which is insane amounts. An example here is the iOS FCP zero click bracket, which, which is where if a victim walks into the attacker's Wi-Fi range, attacker can then implant software and steal all data from the victim's phone without any user interaction. Simply, simply by walking into the range of the Wi-Fi that the attacker had created, they can hack your phone, which is insane. I'm starting to think that Mr. Robot is actually a documentary instead of, uh, you know, fiction. It's insane. The author of this exploit is Ian Beer from Google's Project Zero team, which is a team that is well known for providing major breakthrough in security research funded by Google. It's so it's it's a different but important perspective to look at because without realizing it, we've become so reliant on technology to conduct our daily lives. You need to go somewhere where you've never been before, fire up GPS. You want to quickly chat up with old mate while waiting for the train, you WhatsApp them. What's new on Netflix? Got to pay my bills. You do it online. You shop at Coles online, do a next day delivery, $2. Easy. Your phone apps and online activities are becoming a daily routine, important daily routine these days. And it's the reason that zero day exploits are becoming more and more important cyber commodity because it's important to you. So cybercrime attacks, again, also happening and, and it's at an increasing rate in Australia. Now, these statistics do not truly really represent what is happening in the real world because cyber incidents are not uh, mostly reported due to few things. One is the definition of data breach. The Australian definition of data breach is unauthorized disclosure or access to personal information. Some companies may interpret encrypted data as not uh, personal information because if it's encrypted, it cannot be used to identify any person. So it's not considered a data breach. Ransomware attacks that crypto lock your data but doesn't exfiltrate or steal, it's not considered a data breach. Because of these definitions, some companies, these kinds of uh, attacks and breaches does not need to be reported to the authorities. That's why the numbers may not reflect the real world um, numbers. Also, some organizations may not may not have procedures in place to detect a cyber attack that is happening. And because they don't know the attacks happening in their systems, they can't report what they don't know. The average financial loss has increased about 23% you know, since 2019 and $130 million or so lost to business email compromise, which is basically email account takeover, attacker having full access to your staff's email account. And on top of the increasing financial impact year after year, the number of incidents is also increasing, averaging about 10% increase since last year. 
And again, most of the cyber incidents stem from malicious emails and compromised system, either through uh, misconfigurations or zero-day exploits. Okay. Next one we see, uh, in this slide, we see examples of data breaches ranging from giant corporations to small not-for-profit organizations um, like LinkedIn, Optus, Cabrini Health, Family Planning, New South Wales. This is because cyber attacks are often opportunistic. They will target vulnerable systems of any organizations, whether big or small, for profit organizations with millions of dollars of yearly revenue or not for profit organizations with government funding or grants. The cyber criminals, it doesn't make any difference. Money is money and they'll try to get it any way they can by any means necessary. In this case, you might be thinking, why does it matter if my staff personal account with Spotify was compromised? How is this even relevant to my organization's security? Well, there's a few things. First, it's uh, password reuse. One main reason is because users don't like to remember so many different passwords for many websites. So they reuse passwords for multiple sites. We visit probably 10 different websites on a daily basis with login details like Facebook, YouTube, Osbagen, you know, trying to get those uh, good deals on Osbagen's. Instagram, do you use the same password for all of them? Did you sign up to these uh, different websites with different email addresses? Attackers would compile leaked data from these various sources and analyze the most used passwords for password spraying attack. This is especially true if your staff in your organization sign up to these websites using your organization work email account. Um, this will make it even easier for the attacker. Secondly, is to create a target profile for phishing attack. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a big company CEO with an office in all six states or small organizations with two volunteers helping on the weekends because everyone likes to listen to songs. Everyone watch AFL, everyone wanna have a family. They apply jobs through recruiters, they use internet at home. Combined information from the seemingly non-related data leaks from different companies can be cross-referenced to have a more complete picture of my target profile if I'm actually doing a phishing attack. If I know your music genre preference, if I know your favorite footy team, if I know your family member name or name of your relatives, what job you applied previously, previously at what company, my spear phishing attack would be so much more convincing. So we know that many companies experience data leak at some point, and data leak then compiled and analyzed will throw most frequently used password. An attack here called password spraying is when they pick few of the most used passwords statistically and cycle for the, for the hundreds of usernames that they might, might have for your organizations, however many account it is. And this reduces the chance of account lockout and statistically more successful. Because for example, if a thousand people in the data leak use season word in their password, like winter or summer, you know, winter is coming 2020 exclamation mark, you know, that sort of stuff then most likely my next victim will also use it in their password. So in this example here, we see June 2019 exclamation mark being used as, as the example of most used password. And we cycle that through different accounts. This one account here, try it. Next account here, try it until it's we found a successful one. Then because we're cycling through different accounts, that again reduces the chance of account lockout. One way to combat these passwords we use is MFA or multi-factor authentication. It's an additional verification method on top of your normal login details, which you usually use, just your username and password. You click login and you go in. But in this case, we add additional authentication method because again, in the password reuse attack, attacker may have your username and password, but it is very unlikely they will also have your phone number. MFA adds another verification method using a physical device that you hold. So you use your username and password. 
you click login and it allows for an additional verification method method that you have on hand and you, you can you can prove that it's actually you then you get access so that's mfa uh, we'll do a uh, quick poll here to see if anyone in the organization now use mfa um, what i mean by the first option is if you actually enforce this for all of the accounts that you have in your organization, or you only apply it for some of the accounts, but not all, or you don't use it at all. We'll, uh, help, we'll get Jane's help to run the poll now. We'll probably wait a minute to everyone to submit the results. So we have 100% saying yes for some accounts. Okay, um, that's good, but definitely can be improved. Thank you, everyone. Of course, um, most people here don't uh, reuse passwords uh, extensively for uh, across many websites as an individual, but can we say the same? as a company do we have the confidence that all of our staff in our organization don't do this what could happen if one of your staff account is compromised due to password reuse or phishing attack so in this example here i want to talk about a real life example where a business email compromise happened due to credential theft from phishing attack where staff entered their login detail on a fake microsoft login page which then redirects to the real Office 65 login portal afterwards. As the client use Microsoft Cloud Platform, we as their IT provider, we can see from their Azure sign-in logs that the account was accessed from outside business hours from Singapore and Malaysia, even though the client had no international employees. This is just, a, just a, an example, but it shows the case point that we can we as the IT provider, we can assess this. And that shows a big red flag, especially if no one, you know, everyone's working from Australia and suddenly it's accessed from Malaysia and Singapore. That's a big red flag, which can be automated by shutting, setting up Azure alerts to notify you or your uh, IT and your organization if there's any login coming from outside of Australia, if you have no one working internationally. And we then analyzed that the attacker searched for legitimate invoice and staff email inbox, added the invoice and changed the total amount and added the attacker's bank account in the invoice. They then forwarded the invoice to the financial controller pretending to be the CFO. Essentially, they've hijacked the email conversation here. Hijacking email conversation is a common way to help boost perceived legitimacy because when a recipient opens the email and sees the email conversation from familiar people with topic that they recognize, it'll be much less suspicious. The important detail here that you, I want you to see will be the lingo used, subtle nuances on how certain people in your organization communicate themselves via email. I'm sure everyone here knows how certain people uh, you know, communicate via email. You can tell based on their intonation in the email, the way they type. Some tends to be a little bit more jovial. Some tends to be very short and concise with direct answers, question, and authority. Attackers with high social engineering skills will be able to recognize on these nuances and apply it to the hijacked email. In most cases, if payment do, made due to negligence on your side, these lost funds cannot be recovered unless your organization has cyber insurance policy in place. Now, that example only paints uh, one scenario of direct payment made by your financial person uh, to attacker's bank account. A few more examples that can happen from business email compromise when attacker analyze and hijack your email conversation is if um, staff or your researcher claiming to change their bank account detail close to their fortnightly or monthly payment redirecting salary to a new bank account. Does your HR or account teams verify with staff or researchers directly, verbally or via phone? Another 
uh, point that could happen is invoice fraud. Maybe bus rental company that you recently used was hacked and they sent another invoice to you using hijacked email conversation or a contractor that did a job for you recently, updating their bank details, a locksmith that you used recently, the plumber that you used recently. We're not starting to see that business email compromise attack could happen to anyone and any organizations, small or large, no matter their field of work, finance, agriculture, health services, fundraising company, not-for-profit youth club, and most importantly, the damage that could spread uh, from these organizations that got hacked and the uh, contact that, contacts that they've worked with in the past because it could spread. This then begs the question, do you have a verification in process that's agreed with your debtors or partners regarding a change of financial details? Maybe simple phone call would be sufficient for your purpose. So payment redirection attack will be difficult to detect as sender email address, the email platform will be legitimate in this example. For example, uh, your staff uh, email account was compromised in Office 365 and send email to debtors. From the debtors IT provider point of view, the email will have some legitimate source details. The source sender will be actually coming from Microsoft, not from, from bogus email address. The email security components will be valid if your organization uh, implement them. And it will not be considered a spam by Microsoft, so it means that when it's sent, when it's sent to the recipient, it will be um, landing in the recipient's inbox instead of junk or being quarantined. So it means you have higher chance of success. Uh, what if I have a next generation antivirus in my workstation? Would this detect it? Uh, no, because the invoice attachment, attachment contains no malware. It doesn't contain any embedded code in the, in the PDF because it's only a text change in the invoice, in the invoice, which is the invoice amount and the bank details, the different bank details. So it will not get flagged by your antivirus. So because of these technical difficulties and how your IT person may not be familiar with the way your financial relationship between your debtors, with your workers, with your researchers and other organizations that you've had had financial dealings with, your staff cybersecurity education plays a very crucial role as an additional safety defense mechanism, human firewall, so to speak. And the next one, we'll see a bit of a demo on what could happen if someone downloads a malicious attachment from a phishing email, which is a common attack surface. So imagine your staff received an email supposedly from a HR team and people historically has been more susceptible to this kind of email. It's usually what people look forward to receive, I suppose. They want to see the new KPI so they can get their salary increase. So they download the attachment and try to open it. Attachment's always a dangerous one, especially if it's coming from someone you don't really know. This one here, a calculator is also open without any additional user input, showing that instead of launching calculator, a hidden process can be executed in the background instead and run malicious process. By default, Microsoft soft disable this behavior, which means code won't run automatically, but user can still enable it. Attacker can then persuade recipient by pretending that the content is protected and they need to click enable content to see it and that runs it in the background. Now, this is not just for Word document, but other attachments like PDF, Excel, PowerPoint, and based generally any attachment where code can be embedded in the document. In the next sample, we see Excel macros can be used to directly control staff machine over the network. So when the user enable content, the, the macro runs in the background and establish a connection to attacker's machine and they now have direct access to your staff's workstation, which is bad news. Again, next time we'll have a quick poll to everyone um, just to see your confidence in phishing attack. What is your organization's confidence rate against phishing attack? Using a chain analogy, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. 
Are you 100% confident that no one in your organization will fall for a phishing attack? These days they're getting sophisticated and more believable. Or you haven't done any assessment to understand your risk. You don't have any uh, uh, statistical proof to understand your risk. Or if you actually have phishing training running in place. Uh, thank you, Jen, for helping to run the poll. Okay, I'll wait for the results. Okay, we have 70% we'll I know some people will get fished, 82% are saying that, 18% are saying I've not done an assessment to understand my risk. Okay, Myself. okay. Okay, at least you know that uh, most of your staff in your organizations won't fall for this, so at least that's good. But definitely we can improve. Definitely we can improve. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Jane. Thank you everyone for uh, giving your input. Okay. So circling back on the things that we've discussed, how does this impact on your organizations? So what we know uh, from what we've discussed, due to the evolving shift to ransomware as a service model, these cyber criminal groups, um, because of their shift in the way they work, they'll have increased, uh, they will increase the reliability and effectiveness of the exploit, meaning ransomware attack and data breaches will happen more often with higher chance of success. And because of it, and because it has higher chance of success, when it do happen, they'll increase the ransom demands because people just keep paying them. They'll have higher chance of success, increasing ransom demands, and the attack will happen indiscriminately to any vulnerable organizations, large or small. Again, because they don't care. It's opportunistic by nature. And due to the lucrative market, the attack will persist. The how will change, but the who will not. So we need to act even if it's just taking one step forward. The damage from the compromise is several. Usually when an organization entering a government funding or grant, usually there'll be a probity section defining the obligation on how to treat patient or client information according to Privacy Act or service agreement. Whether you're entering a Department of Health human and health services funding or with department family and fairness and housing funding with DHHS, usually there's an obligation to have staff be trained about privacy and data security with DFFH, usually in the service agreement compliance section, funded organizations are required to comply with Privacy and Data Protection Act. In turn, uh, it refers to the Victorian Protective Data Security Standards. Basically, it will describe on how funded organization must protect clients' information. Simply speaking, every funded organization must have done their due diligence to protect clients' data by having proper safety technologies in place. Also, to educate all of your personnel about the importance of data security and client privacy. Uh, reputational loss, as hackers would try to increase their chance of success by threatening you to disclose the details of compromise on dark web, especially if you don't pay, which security journalists will pick up and publish. So do consider how this will impact future funding and grant applications or fundraising events. The financial and legal impact, possible lawsuits from individuals affected by a data breach, and the compensation uh, damage range from 1,000 to 20,000 per individual, which could cripple your organizations. Not to mention the fine that could incur from government and the investigation effort from government, government which could suspend any organizational activity during the investigation. So I hope we can understand that data breach a high risk threat to any organization, small and large. So how do we defend ourselves? 
Well, one way to look at this is using the Mata ATT and CK framework, which is the adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. This is a framework that describes the attack chain process based on real world observations. For example, uh, most attackers would perform a reconnaissance on your organization before launching any attack. If I'm an attacker, I would try to scan your website if there's any vulnerable service open to public. Do you have any database port open to external network? I could then try to find more information about your network by trying to finding your office IP address from SPF record in your DNS. This is public knowledge. If it points to your internet provider, I can then do further active scan to determine what firewall you have and see if it's vulnerable. Moving on to the next phase, then I can try to develop attack capability based on vulnerable points gathered in the previous phase. Determine key accounts to compromise using various data leaks to, to build attack profile on my target. And this time I want to uh, specify my target as a finance account, CEO account, CFO account, and then build phishing campaign aimed at accounts that I've determined previously, hoping to gain initial access to victim machine using phishing attachment, links or service, like in the previous example, the apps con app consent phishing attack from Jane. So the whole idea of this framework is to break down the whole attack chain so we can address specific areas and plug any security gap that is relevant to your organization, you apply them whatever, whatever suits your organization. This framework gives us, well, from cybersecurity defense strategy point of view, a clear understanding of how we should protect our system. Now that we've understand a little bit about the MADA attack framework, let's try to apply it to the uh, case study group, the dark side group and their attack pattern so we can have actionable defense strategies. From, from the first point of view, the initial compromise, the, this is the stage where the first attack usually happened after the attacker has gained much information by doing reconnaissance on your organization. Here, they use a couple of attack vectors, a password reuse, a phishing attack, and a couple of zero days attacks. Um, we can somewhat prevent this by enforcing MFA to all accounts with no security gap and provide practical phishing training for staff to build experience. Next, once they're in, they'll try to establish foothold, um, or trying to establish a more reliable way to communicate back to their um, uh, uh, control uh, system. And they'll try to spread to other devices in the network. Uh, we can defend against this by having, having the latest gen of antivirus, or simply called EDR, on servers and all of your workstations. Uh, this would stop most of the unauthor unauthorized code executions on machines. We log firewall rules for audits and have stateful, fire stateful firewall, which has the ability to analyze traffic in greater detail. Once they're in and they have good control, they'll try to gain full control of machine by escalating from their low user privilege to a higher admin level privilege. Now, we can defend this by patching our system, make sure we're using a modern operating system. What I mean by that, if, if you're still running 2008 Windows Server, please try to migrate to the latest one like 2019, enforce a whitelisting application like AppLocker so the user can't run non-approved programs. Stop unused services and harden your Active Directory server configuration if you run Active Directory. A website that is good for this is adsecurity.org. It will detail you how you can harden your Active Directory and so on. And they'll try to do internal reconnaissance, see what they can see inside your internal network and a few ways we can defend them on this. And then they'll try to steal your data. And one note about this, if they do um, compromise your, for example, your CFO account. The CFO account most likely, even though it's just a low level user account, um, they will most likely have access to financial accounts and they can just steal it, that they don't need to escalate. So this is why role-based access control is important. Most of these attacks can be prevented by having automated defense mechanism apart from people. 
when the attack happens towards your people, the volunteers that you work with, your researchers, your part-time employees, there's no automated defense mechanism, unfortunately, to protect against this, this phishing attack. This is where user education has a very important role to play, which IT Connection can help with. And our general manager, Basil Vella, will provide all the details on this. And next to you, uh, Basil. Okay, thanks, thanks, Oscar. Uh, Problem. Okay, uh, and hi to everyone on the webinar. Uh, uh, as NFPs, uh, I'm sure you appreciate that raising awareness is a key step to affecting change. Uh, so we trust that the preceding presentation went some way to that end. Um, we're here today to look at what we can do to improve our defences. And one important component is educating your staff. This is the uh, IT Connect, uh, so, uh, so here we go. IT Connection, uh, being, if we go to the next slide, Oscar. So. Yep. So, yep. So IT Connection has been providing uh, training programs to its clients for some years now, and we recently uh, were awarded a grant from the Australian government to provide security awareness training program to organisations free of charge. Uh, the program provides, on the next slide, provides uh, training modules on key aspects of security awareness that all staff will be offered. Uh, it will uh, simulate uh, phishing attacks. Um, so this is uh, based on relevant topics uh, to give the staff the opportunity to test out their knowledge. Uh, this is where things like uh, uh, a safe environment in which to fail is another way people uh, uh, categorize this uh, type of this this method of uh, training, um, and at uh, at the end of that, there'll be a report on the program results and any areas requiring attention. And finally, uh, uh, I look at further strategies uh, depending on outcomes of the of the report. And then on the next slide. So the the program itself, uh, that's uh, the timeline. So once uh, uh, once uh, uh, an organisation signs up to the program, uh, there'll be a, a date, uh, a start date, and a, the commencement will be two weeks of preparation, followed by eight week. The program runs for a period of eight weeks, two months, and then there'll be the follow up uh, after that. And then we move to the next one. Uh, and uh, who, uh, who are we that uh, we offer uh, this program? We, uh, well, on the screen, I, uh, you see you see uh, lots of numbers there, uh, which we're quite proud of. Uh, we have been operating for over 18 years. Uh, we are a managed IT services company, so we provide a comprehensive range of services to organisations that would like to have a single partner to work with on most everything. Uh, we work with a lot of NFPs, uh, not as an intended, initially intended, but uh, I think as a company focused on service delivery, I think we understand and share the importance of uh, the client, and that gives us common ground and understanding uh, of, uh, of how we, you know, I guess how we see things, how we operate, how we in, how we how we speak, what's important, that sort of thing. And then we go to next slide, Oscar. Uh, and in-service delivery partnership partnering uh, is always important. Uh, the slide shows uh, some of the core industry partnerships we have. Uh, you may or may not recognise the names. These are these are some of the more day-to-day -day names we deal with. Uh, but these typically are really your vendors. People provide you Microsoft, provide you platform, provide you back could be providing you backup services, HP providing equipment, whatnot. Uh, but we partner with them as uh, your vendors to keep up to date on best practice and train our people. 
so that our service is constantly evolving. Uh, the goal is to provide great value, and that's uh, I think it's something also I think we share share in, in common with not for profits. Uh, from there, I guess we'll uh, we'll throw back to Jane for questions. Uh, again, thanks everyone for your time, and uh, and thanks again, Oscar, for putting for uh, thank you uh, yeah for that. Thank you both very much. Um, we've had a couple of questions in. Um, Mel is saying I've entered my credentials. What do you do with that information? Uh, we don't store it. So. Um, by using some functions in the web page, we don't store any user sensitive information. Or the only thing that uh, we track is that you've entered it. So that's the activity of entering it, but no real information, no real user information actually uh, keep kept in our system. Cool. Um... Sarah's asking, does the training only cover specifically phishing? No, um, the delivery method is via phishing, but the training uh, topic covers a wide range like password security, um, proper way to use multi-factor authentication. Uh, these days, phishing also uh, happens to your via phone calls and SMS. Um, and other general security awareness topics, not just phishing. Um, and Andrew is asking, uh, do you have a link to the training by Australian government? Uh, yes, I think uh, we can provide. Um, yeah, we could probably uh, get yeah. that to. I'll, to I'll include that, that in yeah. um, the yeah. email that everybody will get later on today, with, which will include a recording of this and the slides. Um, Thank you. What if my, one of my staff forgot to do the email and the week has passed? Uh, so there will be daily reminders uh, by email sent to everyone that hasn't done the training because ideally we want to ensure that everyone do the training. We want to ensure highest possible training uptake. So we send email reminders for them to do the training. Cool. And after the training, um, after eight weeks, what if the results show that staff needs more training? Yep. Um, so IT Connection uh, can provide ongoing training on a subscription basis. Uh, we recommend at least four to six months to develop that habit so staff can actually identify phishing email as a part of their daily work habit because obviously it's easy to to to, uh, to tell someone how to detect the phishing but the difficult part is try to build that habit in their build that mind muscle memory so every time they get phishing email they straight away think okay I'm, I'm, I'm not going to click this i got to stop and think if this is a phishing email or not they don't just click it it's to build that habit that's the important part Lovely. Um, Andrew's always asking if most of the documents and files are stored in, in are secured, are in a secured cloud like Google Workspace. What are the other risks that there would be? Um, well, this is where sometimes those um, zero-day exploits come into play because you think it's safe, but really it's not because these the, the, the these kinds of kinds of vulnerabilities are being traded um, by big big corporations and sometimes when they do get leaked that's when the attackers uh, the, the the general level attackers they, they they use those exploits and trying to attack just like recently you know Kaseya. so that's that, that's another zero to exploits that that's a big one you, you you think it's it's safe to use and then afterwards it's not and previous previously before that you know uh, solar winds microsoft has a lot of a zero day so just because you think it's a big platform microsoft google doesn't mean that you're actually secure so shouldn't be reliant on just technology so this is why it's a, a important to have some cyber, some sort of cybersecurity awareness on your staff as well so you're not just one dimensional 
in your security facet. Because again, security is multi-layered. Uh, like the, you, yeah. you, you want to be the, 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 be able to defend from every angle. Yeah, and, and that's what, and also why. Carry on. Sorry, I was just going to say, uh, and that's also why I think the the cloud backup uh, services exist because you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andrew was always asking, how do you prevent malware hidden in web images? Um, obviously, if, if um, usually with um, stateful firewall, um, you, you, you can check, especially with deep packet inspection, stateful, stateful firewall will be able to deconstruct uh, any HTTPS encrypted uh, traffic. If it's SSL encrypted, it can uh, de deconstruct it and see the actual packets inside and based on the file headers sometimes. And in an image, you would have the, uh, the few bytes inside the email header that defines whether it's an image or whatnot, because that actually what tells um, um, if a file is actually an image or if it's a binary file, a stateful file will be able to inspect that. But the downside is that, is that it might slow down your traffic, so you need to choose your product carefully. Cool. Um, so a couple of questions about um, the training. How, just a little recap for Tricia here. How is the course undertaken? Is it Zoom, email, or in house? Uh, the training will be delivered online via email. Um, so basically, we'll send uh, the participants and uh, an email specifically, it will be very clear, will say, um, this is a training that you need to do with partner up with your organization to provide this training. Please click the link to do the training. That's one aspect. Another aspect is that we'll actually send phishing email pretending to be a phishing campaign, uh, attacking your staff, obviously with your consent and approval at a, at a, at a rate that is undetermined random days, random time. And then after that, we'll provide you with the key management people, the one that we're liaising with, the statistical evidence of who's been caught, whether they've done the training or not. So you'll be able to see the trend or the repeat of vendors that you might need to um, uh, discuss with internally. So ideally, you will have a um, uh, enforcement policy in place because we can help you do the training, but obviously we can't enforce your staff to actually do the training. That will be uh, your uh, internal policy to do that. Cool, and does the, um, the training work with all email domains? Uh, at the moment, um, uh, we don't support free email domains like Gmail and Yahoo. It's usually to the paid accounts like Office 365 or any other paid accounts, unfortunately. Another quick question from Andrew. Um, how do you prevent man in the middle attack? Well, that's uh, quite broad. Um, a few examples is HTTP SSL uh, pinning. Um, which is um, basically pins and have a static SSL certificate for uh, a particular website that you want to visit, but that's uh, that also has some downside. Another another uh, man in the middle attack um, that could happen when you're um, just using some random Wi-Fi or for free. For example, you, you you go to Maccas and you use their free Wi-Fi. You think it's Maccas, it might be someone someone else's um, Wi-Fi pretending to be Maccas, so you don't know. So this is where uh, some of those uh, key cybersecurity awareness training in our training content also addresses that. Um, so just to be aware that some things may not, they seem to be. Cool. Uh, and just another last question, it looks like. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, is this available? Can you do the training on mobile as well, this laptop and PC? Uh, yep, yep. So because the training delivery method is online, as long as your staff has access to internet, they can do it either computer, or mobile phone. These days people use mobile phones to check their emails. It can be done from that as well. 
So it's very uh, short training, five to 10 minutes, very concise, easy to digest for your uh, staff because obviously everyone's busy. They don't want to add burden to their everyday work. So it's quick and easy. Cool. Excellent. Thank you, Oscar. And thank you, Basil, for presenting today. That was really useful. Thank you, everyone. Thank um, you, Jane, for hosting. Thanks, Jane. No worries. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and as I said at the beginning, you will all be receiving a copy of the recording and the slides towards the end of the day. Um, and we'll include some contact links for IT Connection as well, if you'd like to get in touch with them. And more details about the training as well on that email. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. And have right. a great day, everybody. And good luck if you're in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank all you. Right. See ya. Bye.